attendance thing now, and we'll probably do that again, but this way I won't forget at least most of you uh, that are here. Um, and then I can stop sharing this. And start sharing the activity sheet. I can find the activity sheet desktop browser. I find that sometimes Teams doesn't show me the window that I want to share. And I hate to do the whole desktop. But let me share that one. Nope. Hmm. How do I share that? I'll do it this way. And then I'll just move this over to that. It's like a set of, of, of windows or a set of uh, tabs that it allowed me share. And if, I, if I'm not sharing that, it's a problem. All right, thank you for helping me uh, for uh, putting up with that quick thing. So we're gonna talk about um, student input and what students want us to know. Um, I imagine that many, if not all of us, regularly get feedback from our students, and we do this in, in a number of ways, right? Um, the most obvious one is mid semester evaluation or end of semester evaluations, right? And then we hear what they thought and then next semester we say, oh, well, they didn't like that thing that they mentioned or they didn't like the way that I you know, wore my hair or, or, or whatever, so I'll change that um, if I can or forget them. I'm doing it anyway, right? And that's perfectly valid um, if if there's good reason to, right? And if it's an extra work, we're not going to make changes um, based on frivolous uh, requests. Some of us do multiple uh, throughout the semester. We might say, all right, it's the, mid the beginning of the, or it's the middle of the semester. Let's have a, an informal survey, not the official APHIS end of the semester one, but something halfway in between and see how we're doing, right? Check in, see what's going on. Um, some people might do that every other week, every week. Um, some people will put questions, reflective questions into the every assignment and say. All right, we're doing this activity. We're doing this assignment. Um, reflect on that. Tell us how you're doing. Why do we do that, right? Why do we do that? So I would suggest that there's lots of reasons to do that, to get their feedback. Um, and one of the biggest ones uh, is we don't know them and why not empower them to get them thinking about how they learn, what they're learning, and use that to improve our teaching if we can. There's a thing in here, um, we've got five things, right? We don't know, especially if we're teaching remotely, we don't know what their home situation is like. They have lots of different classes, right? We usually have the way that we teach, and that's often it. We often, many of us, don't have conversations all the time with different instructors and that share what they do every day right in their classes. The students every day they've got three or four other classes that they are experiencing different teaching methods. Some of those methods are really cool and if only we knew about them we would grab on and, and do that as well. Um, the more th that we ask the more they start thinking about well how how do I learn what is you know what is my learning process like for me as a student versus what is expected of me um, or is what I'm doing effective um, or should I find some better time management techniques some learning techniques? Um, am I getting the learning objectives that 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 are expected? Um, they can reflect on what they learn. Um, they will start to care to notice that we are caring um, for them, right? And this is really important. One of the biggest success factors uh, for students uh, to help them graduate is uh, or sorry, the indicators is if they can answer the question, my instructor cares about me and my learning. So how do we show them that we care about 
them in their learning? Well, how do you show somebody that you care? You ask them, right? You ask, you ask them questions. You show interest in their in their life and life situation. Then when we hear what's happening in their life and in their learning, um, when we address some of those things, and again, some of the things might be pie in the sky and just not practical for us to be able to address. But if we can address them, um, now all of a sudden they're saying, well, not only are they listening to us, not only is our, our instructors listening to us, but they're making changes. I have a voice in this classroom. I am empowered to take more responsibility for my learning. It's not just being pushed at me, but I'm actually, you know, I have agency because my instructor is empowering me with that agency. And that builds connection. And, you know, if, if you have discussions with other students in the class, they start saying, I'm not the only one who's in this situation. And that builds connection between the students. Um, so there's all kinds of uh, benefits there. Sometimes we have perceptions that are just flat out wrong, right? And students do that too. If you um, have ever been on Reddit, you will see lots of uh, lots of examples of students who say one thing and they're like, that's not really the full understanding of what's happening from a teaching perspective. I'm thinking of the um, slash professors uh, subthread in Reddit, for example, or uh, you know, slash, Mad slash UW Madison uh, subthread. There's a lot of misconceptions out there. But our perceptions feel very real to us. Our perceptions are our reality. And unless we go in and um, are challenged in those and, you know, gently, um, then that becomes sort of the, the, the truth that, that, we're, that we're at. All right, and I already talked about that, and I already talked about that. So where do we get that information? Well, we've all done this. We've gotten information from our from our students indirectly through their reactions, um, through the work that they've done uh, through these surveys. Uh, but there are also some formal places that we've gotten uh, these. Um, so this. Recent fall 2020 survey just came out uh, with the results. They've been processing them um, throughout the winter and and here they are released recently. And uh, Jamie Hankey has, uh, and I will say Megan, Megan Schmidt is here and she's um, able and willing to, to talk in depth about that report on the undergraduate student needs and expectations. Um, Jamie Hankey is here as well. She's been in charge of the, uh, the UCLASS program, which is the undergraduate, um, oh boy. Chat Jamie. and share space. Thank you. Undergraduate chat, learn and share space, if I, uh, uh, right? And they've been doing this since 2015, 2014. It's been a while. Uh, and where they will just go in and meet with students and say, hey, students, um, what are your thoughts on this teaching and learning situation? And it's it's kind of cool. I've been in a number of them. They're, the students feel empowered to share, to speak up. The faculty that are there, um, are very respectful and sort of in the background. They're there to listen and not to like preach to the students about, well, you should do this, that, and the other thing more often. I've highlighted on the activity sheet at the very bottom, um, here are some links to the resources that we've uh, put together over the years from that, I guess, March 2016. Um, and I remember uh, the office hours to student hours, uh, just a simple thing like changing, changing it, changing what you call those, what you call office hours, from office hours, which can be very intimidating to students, to student hours where it's about them and not about them coming into your office, seeing your degrees behind you, your impressive stacks of books, and them feeling, you know, slighted, small, un, you know, not powerful, not feeling, you know, uh, submitting to your authority, I, I guess. Um, that's a simple little twist, a simple little change, and it makes a big difference to help them feel more welcome. All right. So that's why to do it. Um, um, in the, and there are more reasons that I'm sure that you all can come up with, and I will invite you to raise your hand at any point or unmute yourself and just jump in with another thought or uh, something that you see that you want to talk more about. I would love to have those conversations. You can add that in chat if you'd like to. Um, the link that I've put in chat to the activity sheet that I see most of you are in. We now have questions, uh, we're at the spot of it, where there are questions, there's a table of uh, 
an opportunity for you to write questions that you think we should address in this lab. And don't think of it necessarily as these are things that I'm, you know, burning up trying to figure out, but it, they can also be questions that um, you've heard or topics that you've heard that we should probably maybe address um, or on behalf of someone else. Um, here's a question that we should address. So start filling up that left hand column with the questions, topics, issues that we should uh, talk about. And um, because again, you all have experience as educators, on the right hand column, if you see something that you'd like to address and you don't want to raise your hand or unmute yourself um, or put it in chat, you can just add a bullet point on the right hand side and start filling up that. And that way we're drawing on each other's expertise and it's super cool uh, when that happens. So back to that uh, survey, the fall survey. The students put together, uh, well, the, the survey um, analyzers put together five themes um, that they got out of the survey that students spoke about. They kind of fell into five buckets. And Megan, I want you to jump in any time that you feel that I'm saying something wrong, or if you just want to jump in and introduce it yourself, you could do that as well. Thanks, Jen. Keep going. All right. Um, <laughs> and those five things are um, in course design, a uh, course organization and design, uh, the empathy and understanding, building community and engagement um, in the areas of office hours and individual meetings and flexibility and support. Now, these five things, if you scroll down on the activity sheet, you will see that they are mimicked down here. And I will invite you all to add to these. So in blue, here's a quote from a student on, from the survey, right? And here's another quote. So I took a look at that and I said, all right, so what are some supportive practices that would in, that would support these um, concerns or the ways that they felt supported or um, the issues that the students identified? And I said, well, here's an easy one. Here's an easy one. Oh, I don't have a medium one. If you have something in your brain that's like, oh, this is an easy thing to do, or this is a kind of more complicated thing to do, or this is a really difficult thing to do, um, put down easy things, put down medium things, the difficult ones say, here's a challenge. Rebuild everything from scratch, you know, at the minute detail, um, but maybe it's worth it for you. So give people the options and maybe uh, we could figure out what the challenges are and make those processes earlier, uh, easier uh, to do. So share in there with us. Um, I invite you to do that. John, can I just add one little nugget of context here? <laughs> Thank Thanks. you. So these five themes emerged from a qualitative question on the fall survey to undergraduate students. And the question went something like, what are your instructors doing to support your learning, right? So these are practices that are already happening um, that students found really helpful. And I wanted to note that um, to also just validate some of the things that, that people are already doing, right? And when we asked them what they wanted to see in spring, they basically mentioned most of these things again um, and a few specific practices as well. Um, so just wanted to um, validate all the wonderful things that are happening and um, put some context around um, kind of these five thematic areas. And I think that's a beautiful place to start with just about any conversation on teaching and learning and improving your practice. Step one, recognize what you're already doing because a lot of these things we sort of intuitively do. Um, we do it as part of our face-to-face -face teaching uh, in ways that we might not even realize. We do it as part of our remote teaching in ways that we might not even realize. So start off with uh, you know, a simple analysis or reflection, just as we want to ask our students to reflect on their learning, reflect on your teaching and the things that you are already doing. And look at that, look at that list of successes already. And now start there. What are you already doing? Is there a way to tweak it to make it a little bit more successful? Build on the foundation that you've already got and you know, don't think, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? I've got to start from scratch. You're not starting from scratch. You already got a good foundation um, and you can just add a, one more thing. If you add one more thing, you know, next week, you're winning. You're winning the game. If you can add another thing the week after that, another thing the week after that, you know, Look out, look out students, they're going to feel so supported, right? All right, I want to um, take a, a few seconds here to invite you all to think about some of those things that you're already doing and think about this whole concept of 
Um, what are some of the things that you've heard from students? As far as practices that support them, not from the survey, but what are things that you've heard in the teaching in the um, as a student? Maybe you felt it um, so you can speak to that. Um, you might have heard from other instructors uh, or other students from other classes that um, these are things that, that happen in my class where um, that have been very successful. We do this informally, but we usually don't think about it. So I'm going to give you like 30 seconds um, to think about that, and then I'm going to invite you to raise your hand and unmute and share that with us, or um, let's take some time and, and fill out the uh, the chart if you if we like. All right. Anybody want to raise your hand and um, share a thing that you do or have heard of that is uh, supportive for students that students say is supports their learning? I'll jump in, John. This is Tracy Maloney. Hi. Great. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Um, I put in the comment, the second comment on the chart there, um, and I work with a lot of students um, who, as I think is uh, reflected in the comments through that um, survey, which is some of our students, especially our new students, they come into Canvas and every class is so set up so differently. And um, I know with the students that I work with, they're thinking about, especially in this online world we are in, is what discussions are due which day and there's an original post, but then there's a response post. In one of their classes, it shows up in their calendar because the instructor puts it in as whatever, I think point related or what have you. So it shows up as in the due dates. And then there are others that don't. So when they hop onto their dashboard and they go directly to that calendar, despite the fact that many of us advise them like, you really should look at the syllabi, don't just rely on Canvas because it's, you know, changes and it's not consistent and some professors manage it better than others, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that they get flummoxed when they see that they are um, they've missed out on points or opportunities. So I would encourage from the work that I do with students that if it's if you're looking to see for more discussion or conversation um, in those platforms, if you can put it in a way that shows up in the calendar, that's extraordinarily helpful because what they're juggling um, is uh, just huge. And um, especially those uh, classes that don't have consistent patterns or rituals, um, that's really difficult to manage. So if the calendar is used, that does help them not miss things because it's just it's a lot. Yep, it's it, it's a lot and the calendar is a thing that speaking frankly as an instructor, I do not use it as often as I should. I'm not as aware of it as I should because it's just my classes on there and I'm you know, I just teach the classes that I teach. Um, but if you think about it from a student perspective, it's all of the classes and they all mix together, right? So if I've got five things that are due at, you know, midnight on Tuesday in five of my classes, that can be very overwhelming. Um, K-12 teachers are much more familiar with the with the calendars, especially under the elementary um, aged where they're teaching multiple subjects because they will say that, oh, in their science class, they have this in their math class, they have this in their literature class, they have this, you know, etc. Um, and the teachers calendars kind of look the same as their students calendars, but for us, they look much different um, in the scope of things and in, in the wide variety of things that they they that show up. Um, so let me build on that with just a few other th other thoughts. Label your assignments carefully. Don't just say, you know, reading due because they will have 12 reading dues um, from their 
about you know, five read and do's from the five different classes, right? So give a little bit more context in your labeling um, so that they they can say, oh, this is for so and so's class, right? It's not just a, a random reading. I wouldn't, you know, and it, it's uh, like, a, what's beneath this sticker? Whose reading is it? And what is that? But even in the, the labeling, if you can use that, um, uh, David Mac McKay Mac said, said the other day with a video um, lab. These are the meta, uh, the meta information. Titles are really important. Keywords are important. These are the things that um, are searchable that cue us into. Oh yeah, that's right. I've got that reading on. You know that element of physics that I have to do, and that ties on ties in. You know when I say that, I I recognize what's happening in my brain. That ties in with what we learned last week, and boom, that is a connection to your course content. So it helps them. Boom, that's one more course connection. Just the realization that the reading is about this topic for this class helps to the students make those connections, and that deepens the learning, right? Rather than just reading. I'm not. I don't have time to address that right now, um, so I'm just going to ignore it for now. Good. Other thoughts on using the calendar there uh, from uh, people. If you haven't played with the calendar, please go do uh, look into that and jump into that. And then let's see what we've got. People saying here, great opportunity for instructors to create weekly calendars as pages in Canvas. Um, wonderful. And uh, using Canvas Learning Analytics uh, to see some information about submission times. <laughs> hey John. Like yes, Cliff. John, uh, Cliff here, and I guess I, I can put this in there, but yeah, uh, it's a great, uh, that is a great broad question about the Canvas calendar. Um, and if the students are relying upon it a lot, that's <laughs> that does open up some interesting exposures. Um, one, make sure that people, or I just want to make sure everybody listening knows that when you create a page um, inside of Canvas, you can, well, you can put that onto your, um, you can put that onto the uh, student activity list, um, the to-do list, to-do to list. So that's not the same as the calendar, but that's, that's at least better than nothing. Um, but also, uh, are people aware that you can go to the calendar, the Canvas calendar, and create events? That I don't know that you can create them in any other location, but if you create it within the calendar, you can create an event that isn't really an assignment. It isn't a, anything for a grade. It doesn't really have a, well, I guess you, you, can, you can put time information on it, but it is a great way to put something on the calendar that will definitely show up on your students' calendars. So. Good. Yep. Great. Um, and. All right, uh, Lindy and Karen, jump in, please. Lindy, we can't hear you. Yeah, Sorry, I had my microphone. <laughs> like, up. Thank you. I've, that's the second time I've done this today. Um, so uh, I guess I have a clarifying question. In in describing this earlier, somebody said that if the the assignment has to be for a certain number of points, are are there specific parameters that we have to choose on an assignment um, to make it show up in their calendar? I, I think it's just a date, right? Time and date. OK, so if you just go in there and you have a due date in there, that will automatically, even if it's a not graded or if it's a practice quiz or something like that, or does it need to be something that has a point value in the course? I'm going to do a, uh, I'm going to do a quick test here because I don't think I think when you choose something is not graded. Um, I don't think it'll show up as a to do list, but it will show up on the calendar, right? I. I'll have to look at that. Uh, uh, and in fact, let me go. I'll check out the Canvas guide to find out where where they tell calendars. Thank that you, Cliff. Great, thank you. As I'll as the back. mom of three high school students who are learning virtually and different teachers who do different things and everything else, having that like I see the living and dying by the calendar and tasks and everything else. Like we live that daily in our house. Yeah, it's uh, it's. And in some ways, it's nice to have that sort of to do list, that structured to do list. And students, they figure, they game, you know, they, they have to determine how am I going to spend my time? Yes. And if it's not front and center in front of them um, and worth some points, then they might set it aside. So yeah. that's. Uh, okay. 
All right. Yeah, thank and Angela you. brings up a really good point about um, these things need to be transparent for the instructors as well as the students. The more that we can play with these and get familiar with these. And again, guilty, I don't do this as much because I don't have as much experience um, teaching with lots of deadlines. Um, group projects, it's a problem. Um, it brings up another thing that I wanted to talk about and um, OK, I see the caring. Skiba, you have your you had your hand up, but I did. Down yeah, now. I just okay. wanted to say something quick because I use the calendar quite a bit and what I would I use it and they like it and they like it a lot because they can connect that to their calendars as well and see all their deadlines. But the issue is sometimes like you have a, a discussion and you might have a a post post one and response and you can only pick one of those to be on there. So you have to physically put that on the calendar. So I always use my second post, the deadline, and then I have to physically go into the calendar and put the other one because Canvas doesn't allow you to have that. So also think of things that don't have deadlines that are good to have on there that are useful, you know, you know, so there I would I always have when the module opens or things like that. So I use that for a lot of different things, but uh, some of those it doesn't just all work through the grade grade book putting dates in. You have to put some of those things up on there that aren't. And also I use in the beginning, I have a calendar that I link to the beginning of the module and then I have a reminder at the end of the module and I have the calendar. I guess I just would say the more times you can remind them the better. And that's all I was going to say. Thank you. This transitions beautifully into the point that I wanted to make, which is um, at the beginning of the semester, we talked about course and a half syndrome. And course and a half syndrome is the idea that we had here in, oh, I can point to it right now. One of the quotes comes, uh, professors need to stop expecting three times the amount of coursework. OK, this could be a, a an example of misperception versus misperception versus perception, right? If you put every little, the more assignments you have, the more due dates you have, the more their calendar gets filled up and they look at their calendar and they see 30 things and then they just kind of. So whether it's a misperception because it's not, you know, 30 exams that are worth 30% of their grade that they should be, you know, doing every week in order to uh, sort of self pace themselves so that it's not that big of a deal. It could be 30 little two, two point things, but it looks to them they see 30 things and that 30 things can look so intimidating. So have these conversations, be transparent, say this looks like a lot of work, but it's actually just, you know, five minutes a day or, or whatever, five minutes per assignment. Um, so you've got to actively Fight that perception or that misperception that maybe having a lot of assignments does not necessarily mean that it's a lot of work. All right, I see another hand up. Whose hand is it? It's Angela. Jump in, Angela. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, that thought train you were just going down reminded me of kind of related, like finding ways to get students to get the help they need when they are spending way too long on an assignment, which, you know, I, I try to be really transparent. Like I do try to say this activity should take approximately this amount of time. And if it Great. is taking you longer, like that is the site, like come chat, because honestly, a lot of it, I could send you resources all day, but sometimes it's just something where we just need to talk about it for five minutes and get you back on track. Um, so finding that balance where it's okay if you're struggling, even if, if you're spending that much time, like please come, you know, finding ways to get that because I feel like it's it's pretty hard to get them to actually realize that once they realize it and make the commitment to come to office hours or whatever, then they're good. But that's a struggle I've been having this semester. And that build, uh, I thought I put this in here. In the uh, the building community and engagement, there's another suggestion. Um, Create these support spaces, these discussion forums, um, online forums for the students to support each other, where one student can go in and say, oh my gosh, everybody else, this is taking me five hours to do this thing. And somebody else can say, oh, here's a way to do it in two minutes. Or here's, here's what I figured out how to do. 
like they if they learn from each other, then it won't take them five hours. They can figure out how to do these things efficiently. That's going to help not just your student in your class. It's going to help your student in all of the other classes that they're in as well. So. Let them teach each other. I see another uh, hand up and that is. Uh, whoever has their hand up, where is it? It's Theo. Theo. Hey, so that up. I think that sometimes um, dates get put in a lot of different places in in um, pages and calendars, and I think that can create kind of a confusing problem between instructors and students. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and if you have like a date and a page and you bring that into another semester, does that that's something you have to undo in the next semester, which if you don't or you miss it could cause confusion for future students. So. Um, a lot of static content mixed with dynamic content can yes. and pointing them to different places. I and I, I think there is the thing where there's a very heavy assignment mixed in with like 500 small assignments might be a challenge. Yeah, yeah. figure out ways to differentiate those, you know, bigger font, very important, highlighted, you know, blinking giffies or whatever. Um, but yeah differentiating between the, the the easy little routine. This is where course rhythm also comes into play. If this if those small little things are like just part of every day, right? Every day, every course after every course, I have to do five things. One, two, three, four, five. And they're the same five things after every course. It's going to be confusing that first week. Second week, it might still be confusing, but by the third week, they've got to figure it out because they've gotten into that routine. That relieves so much cognitive energy because it's become part of a pattern. Easy to do, just part of, you know, the standard practice, right? At that point. So think about how the, that consistency, um, how you can help structure your course to be as consistent as possible. Um, and yeah, you're right about the dates as well. I've done that where I've said, this is the same stuff I want to do this next semester, but I the students point out that, um, hey, I never took the date out and is it really due? you know, Sunday in in class or we have in class on Sunday? Yeah, guilty. Right, or due in October, like in the spring semester. Right, in the spring semester, yeah. Very good. Other thoughts on um, calendars? Let's go up one and talk about how much reflection is too much. And will reflective questions with each assignment lead to reflection fatigue? Oh, I will say that reflection is learning. It's feedback, right? Feedback is how we learn. And we get feedback from our own experience, which is, you know, oh, I put my hand on that stove and it was hot. OK, I learned that. I reflected <laughs> very instantaneously um, that hot is bad, right? For my, for my hand as far as, as what it feels. It can be as simple as that. If it becomes a small thing that is part of the routine that you do, then it's just part of the routine that you do. Um, if you make a reflection question worth 30 points, you know, on a thing where they have to like say, oh my gosh, I really need to reflect deeply on that, then yeah, it might, might be too hard. Um, but this should just be a small little like, what worked for me? What didn't work? Um, it's like the muddiest point. Um, uh, what are some of the other uh, learning uh, classroom assessment techniques? Muddiest point, um, minute papers, things like that. Very short um, and very simple little things. Uh, and then if you can re respond to those reflections and say, I noticed that a lot of you said this in your muddiest point paper or in your reflection paper. Now all of a sudden you've changed it from I'm reflecting for no reason at all. I've got to put this for no reason at all to. Oh, I'm doing this to help my instructor teach better. That's a good thing that impacts me directly. It also impacts future students, so it's not just oh, this is a pain in the butt, but this is useful um, material. All right, there are things that are happening in chat and I love it. Um, I have missed. Oh, about. Lots of the chat. So let's see calendar dates and uh, items as well. Minutes of help from the instructors. Karen's got a great thing on course uh, 
course planning uh, and workload. Yep, keeping track. We're good, good, good. Um, if anybody can put some of these comments into the active uh, activity sheet, that would be great too. Announcements are good, um, and especially in remote, we, this is a thing we'll probably mention um, over and over this semester. Um, in our face to face classes, in our in person classes, we often just have these little side announcements. We do the business before the class starts, right? And at the end of the class, it's like, remember XYZ. Oftentimes in our remote classes, we forget to do that. Where can we put that? Put them in the announcements, put them in the email, um, make a welcome video or make up a video each week saying, this week we talked about X, Y, and Z. Don't forget to do whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, these are the things that, that students need. Um, and they need a little bit more of it because it's so hard when we get done with the Zoom call to like think, well, what happened in that Zoom call? It's like, I'm done. I need to go use the restroom. I need to go get a, a, a drink, whatever, whatever. So follow up and, and reach out to them. And that brings up another point that we've uh, that, that the students talked about, which is. Um, reaching out to the students and. Um, where is it? Office hours, individual meetings. Uh, don't just make yourself available during regular office hours, but have more office hours, have more opportunities to meet with the students. All right, any other thoughts on that before we move on to the next point? Things that I've missed in chat here. Thank you, Cliff, for that. Um, many links in chat there. Yeah, the one sentence summary, Jamie, that's not even a minute paper, right? That's just the one sentence. It could be like a tweet. Tweet a reflection, right? No time at all, but it does force them to make that connection of what did I learn? How did I learn it? How might I learn it better? And then how do I get it into one tweet? So not too difficult. All right, moving on to the next one. Quote number five, how do we balance this? Uh, with being equitable and respectful of students who have the inability or discomfort to use video. That's an excellent point. All right, so the student quote was, and again, these are, this isn't, uh, it's representative of many students, but it is not necessarily uh, many students getting together and saying, hey, let's come up with this quote about synchronous video. Really good point to recognize that some of our students have Beautiful home office, you know, sunlit, big monitors, um, great internet, um, and th they thrive with that synchronous engagement, right? There's something lovely about being able to see other people's faces, about being able to have that back and forth that we try to have in our in person classes. Not all of our students are like that, right? Some of our students are in the parking lot of the public library because that's the only place in town that they can get Wi Fi. They might not want to have their camera on. How do we respect that while also trying to get um, the students to thrive and are very well supported uh, with resources? Um, how do we make everybody happy? I'm happy to have people jump in, unmute yourself and join in so I can get another drink of water or um, add some more ideas in chat. One of the things that I've heard in other sessions um, is providing a time at the beginning of the session before the session starts. Where you invite them to turn their cameras on, unmute themselves and you have a little back and forth with them. Students can um, talk to each other through that. It can be kind of chaotic and messy the way that our in person classes are before we start um, at the beginning of the session and at the end of the session. And that way, if they feel so obliged, they can turn on their cameras and get that, um, but they don't have to, right? Just as in in-person classes, some of our students are chatting back and forth, and some of them are sitting down, you know, reviewing what they have to do, getting on social media, catching up with texts, messages, etc. So giving them the, that opportunity and permission 
um, during a particular time is a, one way to do that. Any other thoughts on balancing that? Awesome. John, John, this Thank was you. my question just because I lived this with the CP 125 students um, at the start of each class. We would, you know, welcome them as they came into the virtual. We had some students who were in class. We had some students who were joining us virtually. And um, I, I feel like. That they even with us asking them and challenging them to um, consider turning on their camera. Most of them opted not to and it, it there, there is kind of this. Well, I don't want to be the only one who does it. And uh, so you start seeing them turn off the cameras and we'd have small breakout rooms at the start to um, we'd give them like the, the the connector of the day and we'd have them do that in small breakout rooms so they could connect with each other. So the the cameras seemed to be on then because as they would come back they would turn their cameras back off and this is just a class of 20 students. It's not that many um, and we would scramble the groups. So they had gotten a chance to know each other, but the default was not to have the, the cameras on and especially as we get further in that course and you're talking about um, social identities and social justice and it's it's hard to have those conversations without seeing who you're talking to. So yeah, yeah it's just something that I subjects challenge. especially. Yeah, yeah, so it was, it was it was a challenge and I think we did as as well as we could, but um, yeah, I it, it is something that I still spend time thinking about a lot. And there's there's a paradox here because. Um, in the active teaching labs, even whenever I say, all right, let's have a breakout group immediately, like three or four or five people will leave because they just don't want to do the breakout group. However, the people who stay Afterwards, they say, oh, that breakout group was so valuable. It was so useful. Um, so breakout groups can be a way to sort of feed that urge to have human connection with a, a group of students. A breakout group that lasts throughout a semester or you know, several activities or several sessions, those breakout groups can really. You can build trust in a, in a small group. Um, if you change it up every week, then it's every week we've got to start over with new strangers that we haven't built trust with. But if I start off that first week's going to be awkward and these are great opportunities by the way to have those forced painful icebreakers that nobody likes, but we kind of secretly do. Um, or to have some very highly structured activity that they can do without saying who's going to be in charge, who's got this, uh, you know, who's going to lead here, have that structured well enough that there aren't those questions. Yeah, um, and that that can help and that can feed that. But if you make it uh, even in a class of 20, turning on your mic and we'll see that today right here in the active teaching lab, right? There are a lot of people that are they're just not comfortable. Speaking yeah. up and saying that and that's fine. That's absolutely fine. That's why we give them the activity sheet, the chat, the camera. Yeah. It's a lot to keep. You know, it's a lot for us to juggle as instructors and facilitators, um, but it provides options and it's part of that universal design for learning multiple means of engagement. Um, how can you? Not please everybody, but at least give everybody an option. Yeah, so maybe maybe that maybe there isn't much for me to to. Maybe I should not feel bad about that, that they were turning their cameras on with each other in the breakout rooms that you know we use the Google Sheets and the Padlets and the chat and everything else for people to talk. So OK. Yeah, I just always felt a little sad that people didn't have their cameras on, but I guess the fact that they felt comfortable enough to do that in small groups was good. And that might be a really good spot to have um, individual conversations with them too. Like always invite people to come in and say, hey, let's meet after class or whatever. That might be where you have deeper conversations, even with yeah. or without the camera, at least just a one on one audio conversation. Yep. I just read an article on social audio and um, somebody said, well, how is this not like Zoom where people just have their video turned off and it's audio anyway? I'm like, oh, that might be sort of an interesting thing looking at like Flipgrid or some of these other things. Yeah. Angela, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to uh, kind of flip it around a little bit too, like maybe by feeling that safety of like having the video off while they're having these 
sensitive conversations. Maybe for some students that's actually like empowering that they can share something without feeling like they're being watched. Like, I don't know, like I know from my end, every time I have to walk into a classroom and do a lecture, like that's super stressful and being able to be in my comfortable clothes and have my coffee nearby and like I can mute myself when I need to cough or blow my nose. Like it actually, I've been feeling less of that anxiety. So maybe for some students, even though it seems like, you know, having that camera on is like a level of engagement, maybe it is that they're, they are building confidence in a different way than we're used to. I just as a minor, like possible upside or silver lining, I guess. <laughs> and we are like our practices are, our learning practices are changing because of COVID-19, because of the pandemic. Our teaching practices are changing. We are getting more and more comfortable with things that a year ago we were not comfortable with. Um, so this is changing, right? So the information from fall might be outdated already um, for some of our students. For others, it's still fresh. Um, Ian, go ahead, jump in. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to underscore uh, a comment you made earlier, John, about, um, and I think this is the way I interpreted it, that if if the you as a teacher were to engage that you know students one on one, I, I I that's a good point because if the the comment was made by I think it was Lindy that you know when you do the breakout groups they turn their cameras off, so that's kind of a um proof almost that hey they're building relationship with each other and feeling more comfortable so i think us as instructors whatever we can do to build a relationship just like they're doing one-on-one -on -one within those breakouts to the extent that we can do that one-on-one -on -one, i know it's more work you know maybe um you know as you go one-on-one -on -one with a class of i don't know 20 30 people or more but to the extent that we can do that i think it, those cameras will slowly come off because they're feeling more comfortable. But that's just a, an observation and, a, and, and I'm just thinking logically um, yeah. something to try, you know? You know, oftentimes in, in any class, in any discipline, um, and if you think back, this is probably true for your discipline as you went through undergraduate as well. Um, we want to feel like we belong, like people see us, they acknowledge us, they respect us. Um, we want to have that sort of connection, like this is a discipline that I could see myself in. Um, so even things like when you can reach out to the students that you haven't seen for a while and just say, how are you? I have not seen you for a while. I just want to check in to see you. It might seem dumb, but that shows them that you care about them, right? That shows them that you've noticed that you see them. And I think that that's a, a, a beautiful thing. Um, one of the things that we have in the uh, activity sheet that I think Jamie put in uh, that you got from you class was, and I'm gonna try to find it. Um, all of those are in purple. Students wanna be seen as unique individual individuals. So how can we recognize them as unique individuals? Not just as, oh, you are, are one of the athletes who's gone, but like I've noticed that you aren't here um, or uh, race, gender. We all have so many identities um, and we need to honor all of those identities. Um, and so that means we need to ask people about them um, and make them feel like they, uh, they're interesting and they are and valuable. All right, we only have five minutes left and we still have um, a couple of things. Uh, so we're going to zoom through those uh, pretty quickly, no pun intended. What is the potential risk of hearing from students and acting only on those loudest ones, right? So these are the students who have an opinion. They say, you know, my thoughts are, and then they give you that paragraph of what you should do to support them. Um, listen to them. Um, share that out. Ask other students about that. Um, hopefully this is all anonymous so that I can get discussions back and forth. Um, op open up those uh, thoughts or the sentiments to a student forum and say, what do y'all think about this? Paraphrase it, of course, um, suggestion or whatever. Should I do that? Maybe then others um, that are quieter will be like, oh no, please, for all that's good in the world, do not make us do that. Um, and you'll get a little bit more um, insight on that. Um, 
Padlet is a really good one. Um, sending out the surveys. Uh, Peter mentioned in chat um, using the whiteboard in Zoom or Teams or Blackboard Collaborate. Um, those are all good ways to sort of get a pulse of pulse surveys are another one, Karen Spader, um, of what's happening in your class. Um, and ideally, you don't just focus on the big ones. And I'll tell you, as humans, we do that, and we do that with our teaching evaluations, right? It can be 99% good, and then there's that 1% uh, the the one student who wrote this nasty comment, and we just focus in on that, and it's terrible because we think, oh my gosh, I'm failing everybody because we focus on that one negative comment. Very good. All right, what do we do when uh, we're concerned about a student? Oh, ghosting, has anybody had this happen? I'm sure that other people have had that happen. Yeah. Good Dean of Students Office, good. All right, and our last one of the day, even before and now more so in the arrival of COVID, there is a sense of a culture, uh, a sense in the, sh I sense there is a shift in the culture of in-person teaching, specifically around when do we really need to meet in person for class? Yep. What are our students thinking about this topic? What are current uh, instructors guiding philosophy and strategies around the topic? It's really sort of an interesting thing, Cliff. Uh, thank you for putting in that question. A lot of our assumptions um, about what is necessary in teaching are based on what we had as students, right? And how it's been done. There's that momentum of, well, we meet in a classroom every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so therefore we have to figure out what to do in that classroom Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But do we? Do we really? I don't know. This is a, this is a beautiful thing about the pandemic is it's forcing us, whether we like it or not sometimes, to challenge those basic assumptions that we've always had. Um, it's an opportunity to really reshape our teaching um, and some of the learning. Another quick example is. Do you have to pick out a reading for students or can you just say, hey students, we're going to talk about topic X. I want you to go find the reading that works for you or the YouTube video or the Wikipedia page or you know whatever. Learn about it on your own. The Reddit chat, you know, whatever you want, and then we'll come back and we'll share like a one pager of what I think is important about that and let's get all on, on the same page and we can all bring our different elements to that. That puts the responsibility on them. They might not get it right away. It might take some time, but it empowers them to take more responsibility for their learning and it in some ways can take a lot of the. Um, uh, the pressure of you to pick the perfect article that's at exactly the right level for all of your students because they're coming in different levels, different experiences, etc. So how do you do that? Um, give it to them. Let them do it. All right, I see another hand up. Tracy, go ahead. I can tell you in speaking with my students that are, um, I work with a lot of student athletes and we have student athletes that are love school or not loving school, you know, like this is hard, everything's hard. They are so excited to be back in the classroom. So eager and these are students. These students would probably tell me, Tracy, I've never looked forward to school. I want to go to school. So I think I think there are going to be people all across the spectrum, but I can tell you, especially maybe some of the more perhaps at risk students that they are geeked and excited. And my students at times aren't geeked and excited fully on for all of their classes and they are. They want to be with others. They're excited to see their teachers. And I think they're exhausted of Canvas, Canvas, quite frankly, and trying to figure out, navigate that whole system. Um, so I, I hope that represents more students than less. So hopefully that perhaps gives some insight there. Remote instruction, remote learning is remote. It's isolating. Even at its best, we our tools are not as perfect as they can be. We've got new ways to engage, but you're right. There's something amazing and rich about face to face. In ver uh, verbal uh, and nonverbal connections that the physicality of teaching and learning, I think 
that's something that we're recognizing, right? It's not just a cognitive process that happens in isolation in an in individual brains. It's a social thing. We get feedback from each other. We check to see, am I the only one who's not understanding this? And if I can um, make that connection with others, um, I will do that, and that's important. It's 201, I've kept you a minute after. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for speaking up. Thank you for adding to the activity sheet. Um, come back tomorrow from one to two. Uh, uh, let's see, is there a link? There's a, should be a link in uh, any recent email that you got or on the AT webpage um, for events uh, that'll be coming up and at today.wistud.edu. If you want to talk more about that, we can keep on talking about that. Um, and there's a lot to talk about. Thank you very much. Ask your students. I'll stick around for the next few minutes. If you want to unmute and say hi, that'd be awesome. And thank you, Jamie and, and Megan, for helping me out um, with the activity sheet today. That was uh, very useful. Thank you all for coming. Somebody say hi to me. Hi, John. Hi, John. Hi, Margaret. <laughs> hi Julie. Yeah. Hi, Peter. <laughs> Yay. That was like yeah. the hey, John, little how play are ever. You? Good. John, stop the recording. Oh, thank you. That's the other thing I need. <laughs>